Meet Larry Page and Sergey Brin. You might have heard of them, the founders of Google. Now, most business owners don't understand why should I even care about these two guys. Well, I want to take you back to the inception, the birth, if you will, of Google. Larry Page and Sergey Brin were Stanford research students finishing up their doctoral work. They decided that their final project was going to be about taking all of this amazing content that was being created on the Stanford campus in the moment, the latest research, the papers the students were writing. Can you imagine the vacuum of content that no one ever got access to? And Larry and Sergey were like, uh-uh, we're going to fix that right now. So who remembers the Dewey Decimal System? Yeah. Yeah? yeah? Go to the library, pull out the card catalog. Yeah. Those of you who are too young to understand can just tune out at this point right now. <laughs> go in, pull it out, make sure the library is not looking right, and you go find it in the library, <laughs> right? <laughs> remember, it was like, I remember that, oh my god. So think about that. Larry and Sergey had to figure out a way to make the Dewey Decimal System of the internet. Oh my gosh. Right? Everyone is a master, a professor in their own topic. You are all professors in your expertise. Now, are there other people that are also experts in your space? Sure. But there are Stanford professors and there's everybody else. Stanford professors make page one of Google search results. Now, if I'm a Stanford professor, what must I do to get tenure? Publish, Publish or what? Perish. 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 So let's, let's take that example and move that to your website for a minute. You launch a website, you're so excited. You write the check, not very excited about that. And then you wait for the phone to ring. <laughs> Come to me, right? And crickets are in the background. You're like, son of a nutcracker, why aren't I getting the leads? This thing is gorgeous. I am gorgeous. My logo is gorgeous. Everything is gorgeous. Okay? <laughs> but the problem is, you never asked who cared. Okay? As marketers, we're trained to be unique. Unique selling propositions, unique logos, unique taglines. Uniqueness is the enemy of findability. Uniqueness is the enemy of findability because these guys are just trying to sort all of the indexable content, all the pages, all the blogs, all the videos, all the images, right? And figure out who's a Stanford professor. Are you a professor? Are you a professor? Right? It doesn't know and it doesn't care how pretty your website looks. It only cares about your research. And if you have not published a thing since you launched your website, Google comes back and says, well, I came the first time. What do you have for me now? Come on, what do you have for me? Comes back again, nothing. Comes back again, nothing. What are we training Google or telling Google about our professorship? Perish. Yes. And would you take a class from yourself if you hadn't updated your site for the last two years? No. Everyone had a professor that didn't update their site for the last two years? You know, they're just a little bit off their game. There's only 10 slots, guys, on a search result page. One, two, three, four, Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That's it. Eighty-six percent of people never scroll below the fold. And 92 people, the hardcore researchers, will go to page two. So it's an above the fold game. One, two, three, four, five. So I'm gonna show you how to spy. Anyone like to spy? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I just wish I was a Bond girl. It'd be so much more interesting. So let's spy. So the first thing we're going to look at is spying on yourself. This is the easy findability. This is the easy spying because we can take a look at what's already there. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take a look at a, one of my favorite tools, because I'm kind of tool crazy, is a tool called MarketingGrader.com. Now MarketingGrader mimics the relationship you have between a human and a robot. Remember, we're never going to be trustworthy if our engine isn't purring like a kitten. And so it wants to look at our website and say, have you got all the goodies? Are you a professor at the very root of your thought leadership, right? And all it knows of a professorship at this point is that your website is tuned to perfection. So let's see. So I got an 82 on my site. Good thing, right? 
This doesn't always go well when I pull these up in front of other groups. Okay, all right, moving on. So you'll see here that I've got, I've got 30 out of 30, 25 out of 30, 10 out of 10. I have worked very hard to figure out all the levers. You can go and do this. You can run this report, marketinggrader.com, look at where the red shows up and get it out. Because you don't want anything to stand your way between you, the search engine, and your ideal customer. The search engine stands right between our revenue, our impact, our clicks. And we don't want to have any reason for Google to not let us through. So if you can have a Ferrari, you could have a 92 and be in the slow lane. You could have a Ferrari engine, but you're just talking about yourself. Okay? Oh, look, it's about me, about my testimonials, about my demo video, about my downloads, and about contact us. Now, where is the customer in that situation? So let's go in and just take a look at what's one of the easy things that we can fix. So first of all, we're going to Google our name. Whatever comes up on there is so important. Go in there and adjust anything you see that comes up under your name. And you got to tweak what you see. That, those ads are not resumes. They're, they're um, ads, right? Whatever shows up in the top of those search results are ads. So make sure you're not saying home in there. You're saying schedule your discovery call. Let's get together. Let's meet. Mm -hmm. I feel your pain. So it's never about you. It's only about them. Next, who's been to Google Images? Show of hands. We love pretty pictures. Yeah. So what happens is you have a website, and Google's like, game on. OK, I'm going to take all the content and put it in their web results. Then I'm going to take the two images. One's called findability1.jpg. One's called findability2.jpg. Oh, OK. I'll put those in images under findability. So whenever somebody searches findability, there are my two images. Then it sees my video that came from YouTube. And what is it named? Findability. findability. And now it's findable inside a search result. So it's about understanding what your word is, how to implement it so that your masterful piece of content, your blogs, your pages, are A-plus term papers. Anyone an A-plus kind of student in college? Yeah, game on. Okay? Whoever gets that perfect term paper wins first page results. But you got to know what that keyword is. And of course, we have video. YouTube is the number two search engine on the internet right after Facebook, okay? So we've got to think, why aren't we creating video? Video is incredibly findable and very easy to optimize. Just put your keyword in the title, okay? Just put your keyword in the title. Now, let me walk you through another way of thinking about this. So this is called semantic search, a really geeky way of saying what's related to that, okay? So let's all say that I have a taco truck and I'm going to write a brand new blog. I'm fired up. Okay, and I'm going to figure out, okay, I'm going to go and I'm going to think about what could I use maybe in my taco recipe blog? What kind of ideas come to mind? Tortillas. Cheese. Tortillas. Tortillas. Jalapenos. Jalapenos. Mm -hmm. Huh? Guacamole. Guacamole. Yeah, you're all right. What? Beans? Cinco yeah. Cinco de Mayo. Cinco de Mayo. I would add margarita, but that's just me. Okay. <laughs> Was that too big of a jump? <laughs> okay. So this is how we do content gen. We come up with this fabulous idea in the morning. We're like, OK, now I'm going to brainstorm all the ideas I think are perfect for that. Then I'm going to write an article, and I'm going to hope it resonates. Anyone ever heard that word? Yeah. Resonates. Mm -hmm. And then you don't get likes or follows or shares, and you're kind of deflated. You're like, this blogging thing is a complete waste of time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let me show you a different way. Type in tacos. Before you ever create a piece of content, type in the word tacos or taco recipe, whatever your brainchild is for that piece of content. Next, we're going to scroll all the way to the bottom, way down. And you're going to see Google has been nice enough to give you a shortcut list of everything that people are looking for around the concept of tacos. Now, we get to pick. And Google's been collecting this content ever since it was born. So we get the benefit, the great benefit as marketers, to have access to this for free. Hallelujah, right? So I'm going to pick one. Let's see which one I'm going to do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, let's go taco recipes. Oh, OK. So I type in taco recipes. I scroll down. And oh, look at the questions. 
what are different types of tacos? Where do you put, what do you put on a taco? Are tacos American or Mexican? What are they called, why are they called street tacos? Now, these questions are important, right? Because that's the street language of that keyword. So put your ear on the ground and say, tell me, speak to me, right? <laughs> speak to me. And I don't want you guessing because your time is so incredibly valuable. As entrepreneurs, we are pulled in a thousand different directions. I don't want you to keep guessing. Just validate, right? Figure out, I might call tacos, I don't know, um, envelope heaven. That's what I choose to call my taco. Don't judge me, okay? <laughs> and then everyone else out there is saying, well, what about taco recipes? You're like, I'm not going to use the word taco recipes. That's just boring. So what you have to do is you say, look, you may call it taco recipes. I call it delicious envelopes of love. And here's why. You got to bring me into church and then convert me. <laughs> Get that? Yeah. So just don't make things up unless you make sure that you get me first, right? Yeah. Tell me what I think, right? Appeal to my thinking. Google's going to tell you right there in the search results. Oops. And you're going to be able to just harvest. This could be my next eight blog posts. These could be my next eight videos. These could be my next eight social media posts. These could be hashtags. Do you understand? Yes. Okay. So when you're thinking about how do I be a smart thought leader, none of you are salesmen. You are thought leaders, okay? A thought leader does their research, investigates all the other opinions, and then figures out how to deliver that content in a meaningful way. Now think about how does CNN, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, how often are they creating information? Constantly, right? So we call this strategy snacking Google, okay? Who's a good boy? <laughs> Who's a good Google? Okay? And the more you snack him, or her, depends on how you look at it, right? The more it'll come back. <laughs> right? Yeah, so you launch your website, and it comes within 24 hours and says, holy mackerel, look at this thought leadership platform you have just built for me. Thank you. You're clearly a professor in check mark. Then it comes back the next 24 hours, nothing. Comes back again in 72 hours, nothing. Then it's like, well, clearly they're a one trick pony and are not committed to ongoing research. So then you're like, oh, okay, well, I'm gonna do a blog. How many of you blog? Monthly? Weekly? Daily? Okay, remember how hungry is Google? Hungry, okay? The only reason it's gonna be able to figure out whether you are top of your game, a Stanford professor in your, in your region or in your space, is that you are creating relevant, connected content that brings them into church, converts them to your way of thinking, and they buy from you. Yeah. So you remember, you have to connect, convince, and convert. Thank you.